So we know that we can we can strengthen a metal. Well, I, we've, we've briefly discussed that, that this can happen. We don't know how yet, but we can strengthen metals, and we don't change the Young's modulus. And we said that was because the Young's modulus was a function of just the type of atoms, but but that's that's kind of that's bizarre. It's puzzling. It, it, let's figure out you know, how do you make a metal stronger, and and I mean that's that's a really practical uh, application actually. That's what we want, right? We want things to be strong. And um, so how are we gonna do it? Well, we gotta first understand what's happening. So strength. What's strength about? Strength is about avoiding plastic deformation. Avoiding plastic deformation. So let's understand um, how to spell. No, let's understand. There we go. That's better. And let's understand how plastic deformation occurs. Okay. So let's look at that and let's see. Here we go. We got some. Let's draw some atoms. And we have a sense that atoms are going to be organized. And uh, I'm not going to specify here whether we're talking about. Um, atoms in an FCC arrangement or, or you know exactly how they are. I'm just drawing some atoms in, in two dimensions here. This is atoms in 2D. I mean you could consider actually that this is FCC it would work. Um, but here's some atoms in uh, let me just clean that up. There's some atoms in, in two dimensions, a couple of planes of atoms. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna apply uh, a shear stress to this. Now, why is it a shear stress? It's not in really s extremely important right now, but we're gonna apply, uh, apply, applied, apply. I'll make that a Y. Apply shear stress to move atoms. And we want to move them to new permanent positions. Now, shear. We usually use the Greek letter tau. Okay, Greek letter tau. So that's tau, and that tells us the shear stress. It's just like if you you know imagine in a classroom if we were looking down if this was say a top down view of, of a classroom and here's uh, they're looking towards the front. There's me at the front of the classroom lecturing, and here's a bunch of students. There's their eyes and they're looking right. Well, they might be paying attention to their cell phones. Who knows? Who knows what? But <laughs> and and you decide to push on some students to move them. Well, if I, if I push over this way, eventually they move to say they they get they get tired of me pushing on them, and they move to a new position. You know, and then well, the next student over has to move as well, and so on until this guy over here falls off his chair. Falls, there's no chair to move to. That that would be students moving to new positions plastically, permanently. You know, they are in new seats. Whereas if I just, you know, you just sort of push, you know, your neighbor here, and you know, he kind of moves over, oscillates there, and then then comes back. You know, that that's not going to move the people to new positions. They they just move. Um, a little bit, they're elastically deformed. So that's kind of give you a sense for um, what we're, we're we're talking about here with elastic and plastic deformation. So we're, we're really trying to understand that mechanism. And and you know the way I describe students moving is a mechanism. You know they get up and they move. Well, wow, what is it, what is it, what happens in uh, in a metal? What's the mechanism for deformation? So well, perhaps. And this is actually this is this is good. In fact, this is a good starting position. This is initial. And the end, the final state that we're after, to give you a sense for what I'm trying to do, is going to be these atoms moved now to new uh, permanent positions. So if they started there, you know, perhaps they end here. We've 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 applied a shear stress there and there, and moved them to new positions. Okay, that was starting, and this is final. Okay. Well, what does the intermediate position look like? Does it involve this atom here going to this sort of middle position? And I'll draw that. So here's what could be potentially our intermediate position, the state that the atoms have to go through before they get to their new deformed position. If all the atoms in this row here have climbed up 
on top of their neighbors essentially this guy's climbed up here and so is the neighbor and and they've all hit this intermediate position where they're actually spaced out further um, apart and uh, intermediate position so is that what happens this is actually partially correct okay let me get my red pen out and I'll say well that's correct that's how they start and this is correct that's how they end but this is wrong that's not what happens to them in the middle in fact there's a there's a, a way that they move and uh, it's not all the atoms it's not all these atoms moving at one time in fact plastic deformation occurs Um, by uh, step by step or stepwise, one at a time, movement of atoms. Okay, and and so that that that's a correct statement. It's it's true. It's difficult to understand though, because how how can I get if we consider this as our model? How can we get these atoms to to move but only move one at a time and I guess I should have been careful when I gave this nice red check mark there it's not entirely correct actually now let me let me go and change that it's it's one of those times where I marked it correct but really it's not completely correct and what is it well this looks like a little perfect little piece of crystal there's an atom exactly where I think it should be the pattern repeats in fact that's not the case in reality, crystals, organized solids, crystals are not perfect. And in fact, you know, imperfections are, are a good thing in, in engineering, um, in, in solids. We want to, uh, we, and it turns out that they're going to be really useful to us. They're not perfect. So there's a certain type of imperfection that is the, the way that we can cause this step-by-step -step movement of atoms. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw again a cartoon sketch of some atoms. And this time I'll just keep them a very simple lattice just to simplify the sketch. But it, is, it would be, you could, you could extend it out to the same type of plane that I'd sketched above. This is going to be a little bit simpler. Okay, so these are atom positions. And you can see I'm, I'm doing something. Uh, strange or interesting um, here. There's there's something irregular about it. You can you, just by looking at it, you can see it's not a perfect lattice of of circles. I'll draw these little dashes in to give you a sense for the sort of the nearest neighbor or the where the the, the closest atoms would be positioned, and that'll give you a sense for what the lattice or the framework for the the crystal might look like, and you'll also notice that there's one particular defect that just jumps out at you now once I've done that. You know, which one of these things is not like the other? Well, each of these atoms has, I mean, has four bonds coming off of it in, in, two, in this two-dimensional case here, which is quite simplified. Except for this guy. What's going on right there? He's, he's, he's got this, this missing bond right here. Missing bond. And in fact, if you imagine this this um, plane of atoms that I drew here, repeating one step out out of the page in front of you, and then again in in front of that, so you had a stack of this of this sketch, you had three or four of these stacked up on top of your screen, then you would be looking down this little tunnel almost of missing bonds. It would be like you're looking down a line of missing bonds. So there's this line of missing bonds coming out of the page. Okay, and that is actually one of these imperfections that occurs in crystals. And it's a really important one. Okay, and this is because it's a line. This thing that I've sketched right here 
well, particularly this actually, is a linear, it's called a linear imperfection. And it has a special name, which is a dislocation. And the reason it's called dislocation is, I'll show you right now, is, is because of the way it allows this step-by-step -step breaking and reforming of bonds, or the dislocating of, of that feature. I guess, you know, you dislocate your shoulder, what happens, it pops out of position. So what's going to happen here, you'll see atoms popping out of position. Okay, let me just show you that. Okay, so I've, I've redrawn that uh, dislocation there. And actually, this is, just to be completely correct, this is actually called specifically an edge dislocation. Okay, um, so we have drawn that dislocation, and then what we're going to do is we're going to go and we're going to apply a shear stress, just like we did way back here. We applied a shear stress. So we're going to apply a shear stress to this crystal. There's our tau shear stress, and we're going to observe what happens. So what happens is, well, you apply that shear stress and you ramp it up until eventually a row of bonds breaks, that bond there, and it's coming out of the page if you consider the third dimension. And then what happens is that the, this atom gets a little closer over here and it, it's able to reform the bond. And now, where are the missing bonds? Well, that little tunnel, the, the linear feature is right here. And then you continue to apply that shear stress. And what happens? Well, this bond here breaks. And then you can reform over here. And so on. And so the atoms are moving one by one <clears throat> as we apply this shear stress. And, and, and I'm just I'm showing the direction of the, the movement by the breaking and reforming of bonds um, without redrawing the atoms. But the atoms are moving over one by one. Uh, the top plane is moving over to the right. And the bottom, relatively speaking, is moving over this way. And that is the mechanism for plastic deformation. In the